Um, so I'm going to talk more specifically about user requirements um, and more generally user-centered design work that I'm particularly interested in, in, in as a research topic. Um, and we're using uh, apps as a, as a vehicle for that. We're calling these self-reporting apps. Um, I'm a member of a, of a fairly new setup, the NIHR MindTech, which is the short version of, uh, of, of what you had read out. Um, and I'm a senior research fellow. I've uh, joined the, uh, corporate, the healthcare cooperative in the last uh, couple of months. So, so MindTech is one of eight um, health technology cooperatives um, supported by the National Institute for Health Research. And MindTech is the is the one HTC which is specialises in mental health and neuro different mental disorders. And it's been going since around January 2013. The official launch is on the, the 11th of November and um, I'm hopeful, hopefully you'll, you'll hear more about that. And uh, I'd also like to thank you for putting some of our uh, um, early flyers um, on your chairs, um, and which has the website which will also be fully uh, working when the, when the lawn, um, around the time of the lawn. Uh, the MindTech is based at the University of Nottingham Innovation Park in the Institute of Mental Health. That's one of the University of Nottingham's uh, campuses. And I think it's the, from the air, it's one of the buildings in the top left. Um, and so that's one of the, that's the newer camp, one of the newer campuses at Nottingham University. So, okay, so the main clinical landscape for our um, cooperative, the HTC, um, really comes from some of the research interests and the clinical um, expertise within the HTC. So specific, more specifically mood disorders, neurodevelopmental de disorder and, and dementia. And I think you can see that on the right from, the, uh, from a survey of prevalence of mental health disorders in Europe um, from 2011 that they're amongst the, the highest in terms of prevalence, a so percentage. Uh, numbers uh, in, the, in the population that have the condition. Um, so, but we're also um, more broadly um, uh, interested in, men in other mental health conditions. So the research strategy for the HTC is to is to support a technology innovation pipeline. And uh, so to put that um, um, shortly, that's. Um, to look at technologies that may be at different stages of development and to support that. It doesn't mean that the HTC will do all the work, but it may be about routing uh, to appropriate uh, organisations within the UK. We're interested in some in high quality collaborative projects, and we have some partners that have come in from the beginning on that, but we want to expand that partnership. I'm going to talk more specifically about user-led design, which is um, uh, that's what's involved. And we're interested in new partnerships, as I said. We want to become a national resource for, for, uh, te for technology and mental health. And with, with, of course, with the ultimate um, aim of transforming uh, mental health care and services. So the partnership as it stands then, the HTC in the middle, really the point is it's bringing together university academics, uh, the, the, the NHS, and industry. So the university uh, side of things brings together people in engineering like myself, uh, 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 computer science and business school, uh, the, the, the NHS area, um, so that's mainly the IMH but also Medilink brings in some of the user groups in the areas of, 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 of interest such as ADHD and, and 2X and industry, the initial partners are listed on the right there and I'll just say some words about um, two of those. So that's, and we're interested in building that partnership. So, so we've already heard it from Buddy, so I won't, uh, I won't say, some, uh, say more about that in my presentation. But Buddy are one of our SME partners. Pleased to have. And another of our partners is, I think it's, um, I'll say a bit more about this, uh, we, um, is QB Test Limited. And they, they have a system for objective assessment of ADHD. And currently it's a desk-based system that uses head tracking. And the user will, will, will come in and they will, uh, to the clinic, and they will, they will, they will, they will be shown um, coloured squares and uh, circles. And they will click um, as soon as they, 
when they see a particular patterns which they're, which they're asked to, uh, to identify. And the idea of, of, the, of the clicking in com combination with the head tracking is to provide some kind of um, quantitative measure <coughs> of attention um, and impulsivity. So the graphs on the right, just to give you an idea, so they're just graphs, they're mainly graphs of the, of the head movements at the top, and then lower down you've got the green and, and red dots which, are, um, which signify uh, clicking on either correctly or incorrectly on the patterns that they've been asked to identify, and the timings of those clicks. So that's the desktop system that exists. And so what we're doing is we're working with QB Test to look at whether we can transfer some of this into an app-based um, form. So we have a, the app on the right, it, it's, rather than showing squares, it's showing letters of the alphabet, but it's a similar process where the, where the, um, the, the client's coming in to, to uh, identify patterns within, within uh, sequences of letters, and again, to provide measurements of inattention and impulsivity. And then um, this is work in progress, but the, then we want to use the uh, the inbuilt accelerometer and gyroscope facilities of smartphones to, if it's possible to do that, to transfer over the head movement um, um, part of the desktop system. Okay, so, and this is just a slide from this is my uh, um, and colleague actually, the technology lead for Mindset, John, John at the back, at the back there. His personal interest in this, personalised ambient monitoring. So this is really trying to use all of the features of more advanced features of, of smartphones uh, for uh, tracking and self uh, monitoring for uh, persons, for example, with bipolar disorder. Using uh, so this is in the environment, so maybe using light levels to to, to help people find uh, to see where they are within their house, for example. Use of GPS, use of the accelerometer to capture data about movements. Um, can ask John more about that. Okay, so now I've come from a, another um, another uh, research program called Match, which some of you will have come across, um, and uh, which was primarily concerned with medical device um, evaluation. And this is a this is a research council program that's, that was have been funded for uh, the last ten years, which comes to a, uh, to an end, at least in its present form. Um, the end of October, and, and I'd just like to show, to show some of the work that, that, that I was doing within Match that I think can transfer well over into, into, the, into the HTC uh, um, areas of interest. So, so, um, so we've done some work, in fact the first three snapshots really on the left are uh, part of a project we did on asthma, mild asthma self-reporting, and what we were interested in doing was, was, uh, was, was was combining uh, a self-reporting diary with physiological measurements. So, and this could be manual or, or automatic. So, in fact, we have a, a um, um, an Excel uh, ex Excel flow meter on the left, which we and we, we were asked we were asking people uh, who participated in this research study to enter those readings in the usual way. Um, but also to take readings from a Bluetooth pulse oximeter. So that's one thing we're very interested in doing is seeing the potential for combining uh, medical devices with the self-reporting capabilities of, uh, of, of diaries. And, and so that just gives you uh, the, the, the graph that you can see are some traces of, the, of heart rate and, and uh, pulse, uh, sorry, yeah, oxygenation um, from, uh, from, the, from the pulse oximeter device. Um, second, the right is a uh, uh, is a is a is a project um, on sick for sickle cell anemia, where which is, where, uh, where where the patients are, are following their tracking their the pain that they experience in sickle cell anemia uh, by uh, identifying parts of the body and then the, uh, where they're experiencing pain and then rating their the severity of that pain. And that study's just started in in, co in conjunction with the Sickle Cell Society. And on the right, perhaps more relevant to today, is a it's a um, it's a collaboration with a, a, with Nurture, an IVF uh, clinic at the uh, base uh, at Nottingham, um, and they're interested in tracking stress at different points within IVF treatment, and that's just one of the uh, um, one of the questionnaires that's been uh, that the patients are using to track their stress 
at different points. Okay. Well, I think some of this uh, should tra transfer transfers over into the mental health domain, even if it's more uh, physiological. So, so the main subjects of, of the of um, what I'm particularly interested in in a research context is a user recitation or user, particularly in the user sense of design. And uh, I'm sure you've read some of these yourselves, and, I, and I'm not here to preach, but this is a, so I've put perceptions, and I've also we can take the, the problem as something that can require a solution, or something, um, um, or a question uh, um, uh, concerning user solicitation, that it's perceived, anyway, this, is a, this was a survey of, of pain apps um, in, a couple of years ago, um, suggesting limited involvement of health professional, uh, professionals during app development. And then a, a second paper, which I might like to refer to, uh, is about lack of end user involvement in the app design process. Again, that's a um, paper from, from 2012. So really saying, yeah, there should be more user-centered design. And of course, there are those demands, some of those have been referred to today. Some of them are regulatory, particularly in the US, um, from, the, um, F, from the FDA, um, and particularly for, for apps which are medical, seen as medical devices. Um, it's, it's an imperative to, um, to apply HE75, for example, or, um, and again, it's a, a good way of fulfilling the medical device directive demands are to apply a, a, a medical device's usability standard, um, which I've mentioned, that like IEC 62366. So things have moved on in the medical device area, and if your app is a medical device, or at least it, particularly for the, the, some, of the, some of the apps that we're interested in, which are being used in conjunction with medical devices, then, um, then there is a regulated demand to use, um, to apply those standards. Or at least it's a good, using those standards is a good way to fulfill the regulatory requirements. And then we have patient public involvement. That's an NIHR imperative. That's a good thing in itself. And then if we look interested in the, in the sort of the overall area of implement, implementing apps into, into practice or uh, in technology in, in general into practice, we can refer to Brooks from 2011, which puts, uh, puts some emphasis on the users within mental health, the mental health services, um, the, the, the views of users can be either conducive or impeding to innovation uh, um, within, uh, within health services. So there's a whole area of implementation science, which I think is worth looking at in more detail. In fact, we have an implementation strand within the HTC, which goes in parallel with the technology strand um, um, under Emma Rowley at the University of Nottingham. So, so I'm interest, I was interested um, in sort of pulling together some of what we've learned from our medical device research. Um, towards a protocol, not necessarily a standard, but some guidelines, maybe some recommendations. I'm sure some of, you, you may be using some of those already if you're a developer, um, towards a more user-centered approach to, to app design. And I think what, one of the things we found, and we tried this out ourselves, and I've got some data to show you about that, is the importance of conducting a phone audit before, in, before commencing a research study. And I should say these, these are mainly about apps that have been developed in conjunction with researchers, not, not consumer apps. And really, what we found is it was, it was very useful to discover the range of, of prior experiences, having used an app before you even know what an app is, and preferences for phone functions amongst the participants or potential participants. And also to then preempt any possible conflict between the normal daily use and the research demands of, um, um, of the of functions on the phone. Secondly, to, to make sure we investigate the tolerance of our app design to the real world use. And I'm sure that what the, the apps that have been around for a while will, will know how important that is and, and that users don't keep their devices uh, turned on or charged up and they don't respond to prompts. And, and so that's this real world and we just have to make sure our designs fit with the with those with, um, with real world users. Um, the obvious one of, of ensuring data collection um, and storage. And again, that comes, as I mentioned, that came up in, uh, certainly has come up in an ethical approval um, for some of our app designs 
where text messaging was, was at least we went, we went in, maybe to explain a little bit more about the points I made, we went in and said we, we are going to use an app for this, uh, but we, might, we may use text messaging for an, alter, as an alternative if we don't want to use their apps, and the ethics committee didn't like that, but they were happy for us to use paper as the alternative to, the, to, the, uh, to an app. Um, and then finally, to, 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 make, to do some pilots and, and, and determine patient burden and adherence, and actually burden came up in, in, in ethics and discussions as well about you know, how many times are you going to make demands on users to enter the data. So we're very interested in the frequency of prompting, and so we, we think that um, we should we do some pilot studies and look at the adherence and maybe even consider using more passive monitoring if we think the burden could be too high or if it could increase data collection. So the real sort of take-home message for that is then about early stage user involvement and participatory design um, um, sort of being used to reveal the needs. So here's some of the data then. This is from, one, this is from the IVF uh, stress study. And we just thought, well, let's just do a quick survey at the beginning and see you know, what people, how the, the people, some, some of the users had ordinary phones, some of them had smartphones, we found out 75% had what they considered to be a smartphone. And then do you use email and internet access? Well, that was around 80%. Some of them didn't have phones with those features, so that, that was a partial explanation there. We wanted to know whether they used internet coverage. Um, well, if it was including their contract, maybe they use it more. So we did want to know, find out a few more things about how the users um, had access to internet coverage on their phone. Do they use an alarm clock? We knew we were going to use that in the to prompt uh, for data collection. And do you, are you familiar with the use of apps? As you've seen, eight or eighty percent. Again, maybe a line, well, or, or certainly aligns to the fact that some of the users didn't have smartphones. And now, if we look at the the, the frequency of app use, we can see that it's not by no means the case if you have a smartphone, you use an app every day, or you, if, if you, depending on what your definition of an app is. And so 53% consider they use an app every day, 17% weekly, four monthly, but you know, a sizable number consider they didn't use any apps on their phone. And that's more than the number that, had, um, that um, didn't have smartphones. And then if we look at communication preference for this particular study, and we, again we were careful to say uh, that you know, this, is, this is just to get an indication and we won't necessarily have to provide all of these uh, um, communication uh, routes. Um, okay, apps are the highest, but then text messages are still significantly high. A telephone conversation is a preference for 8% of the respondents. Um, I've got 1% would like... Um, well, that's just around one because there were 71 in the study. So one out would still prefer paper. And if we didn't ask specifically about email because we weren't intending to use it, but others raised email, and again that's three percent, around three percent, most of them mentioning the email. So I think you know we learned quite a bit from the from doing an, that early audit and it didn't take long to do. Okay, so example two then. Um, so we were interested in this is this is for this was for the asthma and asthma study. We were just in, we had a small number of, 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 uh, of users here, and we gave them the phones, and they had them for two weeks. In the first week, they answered a diary every day, and in the in the second week, they, an, they answered a diary in the same way, but they also took physiological measurements from the devices I already mentioned. And we were interested, this is this is from the di this is the data from the diary part of the study. We were just interested in what the adherence was you know, amongst a small sample. And you see it's not, and, and we did it for the week. So you've got week one, week two, and the average over both weeks on, in the first three columns. And you see it's quite typical for, uh, for, um, for actually for chronic long-term conditions for treatments is around 50% you know, or less is not untypical. And so you know, we need to bear that in mind. Um, and also that should tell us what, what uh, about something about sample size for, the, for a larger study. And then if we, but we look on the right, um, we also thought, well, let, well let, let's capture the data for full that diary entries, because you know, quite often people miss questions. So this is so the numbers on the left are about, did they actually do the end diary entry? And you can see that in week two, someone didn't do it at all, <laughs> even though they were, they were um, had an inconvenience allowance to do it. And, and then, agreed to take part in the study, 
um, but on the right, even amongst those that had diary entry days, um, we didn't have full data collection on those days. So again, we, I think we learned something about adherence that then we could use in the, in the wider study. So this is my last slide so, uh, um, about the research uh, that you know, we, we did, we did a, a, just a quick interview with each of the participants at the end of the asthma study and just to get, gather some information. I think the, the message from this is really that there's quite a, uh, although the, you, know, around, you can see around half found the technology nice or easy to use or didn't affect my lifestyle or didn't, the technology didn't, well, please that the technology didn't affect their condition um, in, in, in all cases. And about a considerable number were more, felt more aware of their condition using the app. And I think that you can see there's different interpretations of that. So you know, easy to use. A couple of them found it interesting, maybe they hadn't used a smartphone before, we weren't giving them the phones to use. Maybe not surprisingly, for the same reason, half, half, around half had some problem, technical problem, but then we had you know, some interesting points, I'm not confident that the data was uploaded, or um, it was a bit of a hassle actually, you know, I, I, maybe I'd, the person here is saying, I really wish I hadn't taken part in this study at all, um, it was a bit, you know, it's overkill to do all this data collection for mild asthma. I and mean, you've got some other points, I don't need to read them all out, but I think, you know, people were, okay, it didn't affect my lifestyle, I'm a bit more cautious, I had to plan, and, and uh, I had some annoyance, but I think the point being, there's different, differing opinions here. Um, and then the, the final one about being more aware, two of them thought it was a good thing that they were more aware. Uh, perhaps the one that, um, that, that wanted to, to remember um, his inhaler, and what's the in this case, and... Yeah, finally, yeah, the, the, at least even though the, what, nobody said that the technology affected their condition, at least one of them thought to thinking about their cough might exacerbate it. So uh, there is a, uh, a relationship between the, the data collection and the, the condition. So, so I, I hope I've just um, provided some um, points of interest that I think that, that do stress that if you do some user work early on, you can learn some useful things that you can feed back into the design. I think we've all, we're, all, we're all about early, early stage design and getting it right first time. And uh, I think you know, you can, doesn't, they don't have to be onerous in you know, large studies to find out some quite useful things um, and, and also to take you on to the next stage in the study, whether it's about sample size or it's about uh, the potential for adherence in the wider study, you can learn quite a bit from that early work. So, okay, so this is my, probably my last slide, apart from the, the names. These are some of the, thing, the other things that we're interested in the, in, the, in the HTC. So I've talked mainly about the research, but we're interested in maximum experience in health economics, for early stage um, evaluation of medical devices, which we were, we were interested in. For, for mental health technologies also. Uh, PPI, we have a big component of PPI within the HTC, which is an IP. Um, and I think we're not going to do all of these things ourselves, but we're interested in perhaps uh, working with others to see how we can route people who may come through, through the HTC. So I'm really, really pleased to be at this event as a result uh, um, um, of that. And so, just to mention, Chris Hollis, he's a as our a, a, a clinician, he's, he's a, mentioned earlier, he's the, he's the principal investigator in the HDC. Professor John Crowe's technology lead is at the back here. Um, Matt's also here from the, from the, Men, the Institute of Mental Health, um, who's involved with some of our PPI work. And that's myself at the bottom. And thanks for listening, and especially at the end of a, of a long, hot day. Um, and I hope for some interesting discussion. Yeah, yeah it's not the end of the day. It's got to stay in. It's be entertaining now. <laughs> um, I'd like to thank you for your presentation. Anybody have any particular, particular focus questions here? Well, one of the things, that, uh, I don't know if you picked this up, but something I heard last week with regards to the usability testing. When you're going through that, you have to identify each particular group that might be using your technology and then have a minimum of a sample of 30 people in each of those groups that you actually test the technology again against. So it's each clinical condition and then each age group goes, so there's three conditions and three, three age groups, so three times three, square of three. 
Yeah, it's quite, it is quite prescriptive, but I think that, that the information has, has been gathered along the way and, and what the FDA have issued some information about why they've rejected uh, devices on the basis of the news of, of usability. And it's useful to look at those and you can you'll see some of the reasons being some of the ones you just mentioned. Uh, so it's not just about it's about, it's about understanding the whole process and identifying the user groups, as you said, and, and actually having a, a, a method of getting the, of actually getting the results and, and then feeding them back into the, into the design. So it's quite a lot to get hold of. And then, so it's a medical device app. There is a, there is a um, you know, you are in that whole sort of very, quite strict regulatory um, domain, which I'm sure you'll know if you've tried developed. The people who started developing apps before the FDA uh, announcement on that got, I think, got a big shock when they realised that most of you know, their apps were going to be medical devices. Um, especially if you, even, even if it's in a, even um, um, the same app, if it's used for a population that has a condition versus the, uh, the general population who, who are, are considered well, one can be a wellness app and not subject to regulation, and, so the other, and the same app can be a medical device. So it is a pretty uh, uh, tricky area of regulatory. So yeah, it, it's basically if it does a test, it reports on the test, and it changes your clinical condition or your interaction with it, then it's a medical device. Um, so if you do a colour blindness test through Ishikara, so I test you with coloured figures, and then say red, green, colour blind then invariably it's a medical device. And the problem being is, of course, it might work perfectly well on an iPhone 4, but the iPhone 5 or whatever might have a different colour rendition or an Android, and therefore it should be tested on each of those platforms. Because <laughs> you might give a wrong test, wrong app, wrong, wrong result. Yeah. Question here. You had the, my favourite 4 letters SBRI flash up on uh, your last but one slide. And uh, obviously that's aimed at probably at uh, getting SMEs uh, funded through the SME program. How can we engage with you? Um, are you considered an SME or uh, an academic body in, in terms of uh, get, getting you in terms of use of the user validation, which I thought was quite useful? And having been involved in SBRI, it would be useful to engage with you in, in, in previous projects. Well, actually, can I pass that over to you, John, about SBRI and how that works? Yeah, yeah. Is this, did that the, the recent competition you're referring to? There was the um, end of life application and uh, um, the, the mental health application yeah, as well. We're actually in discussion with SBRI about um, when it gets through to the stage, that the people who do the, there's the phase one, the, the ones who go through to phase Correct. two, yeah. we're in discussion with them about then um, being able, well, SBRI being able to put people in touch with us to act as um, consulting in terms of uh, clinical people in that area Good. to offer advice. So at the moment we're talking to SBRI to try and sort of sort that out because I think they normally pay for consulting but they're thinking of coming to us for that particular aspect of That's the usual to know. It wouldn't necessarily have to be a small business. Yeah. No. <laughs> the other one to look for is uh, eye for eye uh, ideas for innovation yeah. because that, again, is, in, I don't know if it changed the rules in the early stages, it used to be, it had to be an academic and, and, um, or a, a clinical partner, but they've seen that change that. But as long as you've got an academic or um, a clinical partner, which again is a good reason for talking to one of the universities. Yeah. Yeah, I'm on the early stage I sit on the panel and the, the I think the requirement now is there simply has to be two partners. Two partners they, as opposed to Yeah, the, but it can be as you say an SME and either an academic or SME and hospital. Um, one of the things we're keen to do from the HTC is to well either advise people on when they're writing their applications to stay for I for I or to um, to actually be partners on them as well. Are you generalists working on the bipolar project? Yes. Are you aware of the Italian project that's doing something very similar? The Monaco one. Uh, Torino, I think, was it? Uh, there, there, was, there, were, there was one in, um, yeah, around northern Italy called Monaco. We know those people. Right. And there was also one called Psyche as well. All oh, right, Monaco, because there was a chat from there at Warwick University, and we were speaking about it. Uh, was that Chris Hollis? No. Uh, sorry, Chris. Um, I don't know. Chris James. Chris James. Yeah, no, it was a gentleman from Italy who was actually talking okay. about what they were doing. We'll have a chat there. <coughs>
because there's two big EPSRC have just funded two big projects which is to do with collecting data in the home. One is called Sphere based in Bristol and there's the home uh, hub of all technologies which is based in Warwick. But we're planning to talk to them because they're, they're doing things which are very close to what we were trying on PAN but on a much larger scale. But they're collecting data which I think we could actually apply to do what we were trying to do on PAN. Is there anything else sort of different that the Italian one was doing which they do voice snippeting to, to take stress levels and things like that and speed of voice? Yes, that, that's an uh, interesting so that way of doing that. Yeah. We, I just had a grand turn down, but we, we were working with people in Imperial who we were going to use speech recognition to do that. And computer scientists at Nottingham who were doing facial recognition for, uh, for the social signal processing yeah, yeah, yeah. area, which you could probably apply to healthcare. Yeah, they're actually part of the HTC as well, yeah. people doing the facial recognition work, yeah. so uh, the emotion work. Yeah. Um, but, um, We've got some, I mean, some interesting things coming out there and a few more abbreviations that everybody may not know. It's BRI, I happen to know about that. But um, I think that's an illustration of one of the things that handies can do. There's so much going on in different parts of this community. And it's a different world if you're a small micro startup app developer, that academic community, the established support stuff through SBRI, through TSB, through I4I, for I, a few Dallas, you know, you can throw out a few more of these, these acronyms. And there are loads of them. And what we can help you do is, you know, if you don't understand what these things are, please ask. Because they make some of them up, they don't know what they stand for. <laughs> and it's always great fun to out them. What does that mean? I don't bloody know, it just sounds good. Um, so, lots of issues flying out of there.